This program has been made possible by the friends and partners of Dufresne Ministries. Welcome to today's episode of Jesus the Healer. We're so glad you've joined us. For a time now, we've been studying what we're calling healing school, and we're going through the different healings that happened under Jesus's earthly ministry, and we're studying them. So we invite you, get your Bible, get a notebook, get some pen, pencil, follow along with us. Tell somebody that we're on. We'd love to have them join us too. And uh, we're just going through and studying these healings that happened under Jesus's ministry because in them we can find out what we need to learn of how to receive healing yes. and how to also minister healing. So this is why we're studying these in detail, verse by verse, line by line. We've got an intimate group of people, some of our friends here with us for this intimate setting to come with you, to come to you in your home, your place of business, wherever you're at. So we we're so glad you've joined us today. Turn with us if you would to Luke chapter 14. And we're going to start reading in verse 1, and we'll go all the way through verse 6. Luke chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. We'll read the whole passage, and then we'll go back and look at it verse by verse. Luke chapter 14 and verse 1 reads, And it came to pass, as Jesus went into the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day, that they watched him. And behold, there was a certain man before him, which had the dropsy. And Jesus answering spake unto the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? And they held their peace. And he took him and healed him and let him go. And answered them, saying, Which of you shall have an ass or an ox fallen into a pit? and will not straightway pull him out on the Sabbath day. And they could not answer him again to these things. So let's go back to verse 1. It says, And it came to pass, as Jesus went into the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day, that they watched him. So Jesus was invited to eat at the chief priest's house on the Sabbath, and Jesus went to his home, obviously, and evidently straight from being in the synagogue that day. So right after church, they're going to feed him lunch. And uh, their intent maybe was to make him lunch. I don't know. But they were going to feed him that day. But it says here, the last phrase, and they watched him. <laughs> they're watching with scrutiny. They're not what they he wasn't invited so that he could know he has a, 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 a company of believers around him. He's got a company of people scrutinizing him. So if we could say it, it's might might what be what you would call an unfriendly setting. They're not there just out of hospitality. It's a setup. <laughs> and verse two. And they watched him. Why did they watch him? Verse 2 tells us why. And behold, there was a certain man before him which had the dropsy. I'm wondering, just a thought, did they put this sick man in front of him right on purpose? As part of, I want to catch him in doing something wrong on the Sabbath day. It's interesting. It says that there was a certain man before him. So you get the idea that possibly right across the table. From where Jesus was sitting, they sat this man with the dropsy. Now, dropsy is a condition where excess fluid will accumulate in the tissues. So it can uh, accumulate in the limbs. It can accumulate in the abdomen to where the abdomen is extended. It's enlarged out of proportion to where uh, if it's in the, the limbs that even the legs could burst open. Wow. 
with all the excess fluid and it could it, a very difficult condition so it's something that would have been obvious that's what i'm trying to show that this condition would have been in this man would have been something obvious and he, they set him right across from jesus i believe that's why they especially watch they want to see what's he going to do if we set a sick man across from him on the sabbath day <laughs> So uh, evidently, though, this man was at least still mobile. He could move around, right? He was able to come to this location and join him. So verse three says, well, verse two again says, and behold, there was a certain man which uh, before him, which had the dropsy. And Jesus answering spake unto the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? Now, look at this wording and Jesus answering. Well, there's not been nothing asked yet, except they put a sick man across from him. He's answering that. He's And Jesus answering. He's answering this setup. <laughs> I would call it a setup. And Jesus answering spake unto the lawyers and the Pharisees and said, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? Before Jesus ever does anything for the man, he asks this question. Why? Because he knows what their argument would be. What's their argument? It's not lawful to heal on the Sabbath day. And we have those who are experts in the law sitting here to evaluate your actions. So they think healing, again, is not holy enough for the Sabbath day. Isn't that what was generally thought? But Jesus healed on purpose on the Sabbath day to disarm wrong thinking, to discredit wrong thinking, to demonstrate he healed purposefully on the Sabbath day, which was their holy day, to demonstrate that healing was a holy act. Yes. Yes. It is a necessary flow for humanity. Amen. Healing is not a less than flow. Amen. It is not a substandard flow right. it is equal to god himself oh, for it flows from god oh, himself yeah. yes. healing is an act worthy of god yes. Amen. Oh, wow. healing Amen. is an act worthy of the holy day yes. god doesn't have an unholy flow That's right. <laughs> That's right. yeah. so healing is holy enough and worthy of the sabbath day Amen. Verse four, when Jesus asked them the question about this, verse four said they held their peace. Why? Because they knew that their answer was in opposition to him. And he took him, he took the man with the dropsy and healed him and then let him go. Notice, of course, they didn't respond to him. They kept their opinions to themselves at this time. But yet they were still there critically. Uh -huh. yes. They were still there watching, yes. not drawing yes. right. on him, right. but watching. It matters that when a healing flow is present that we draw on it yes. and not just sit back and be spectators of it. Yes. That healing flow is there to bring help, yes. respond to a healing flow. In a service when your pastor is ministering and possibly there's a segment of time in the service where healing is uh, announced or he, people are prayed for, uh, respond to it. Yes. Don't just sit and watch it as spectators. Yes. Have you ever noticed this? If you ever go to any kind of, kind of a sports event, uh, whether I, different countries have different sports events that are very big in their country. And you have your participators who are out on the field. Then you have your spectators who are in the stands. And there's always more spectators than participators. And the participators are paid 
Yeah. If it's a professional team, they are paid to participate. Spectators pay to watch. So it pays you to be a participator in what God's doing and not just a spectator because it'll cost you something. If you're just going to spectate, you'll miss out on what you could have had. You'll end up being having something less than what you could have had. So we always want to be a participator. And these men weren't participating. They were spectating. They were watching to find not something good that was going to happen, but something wrong that Jesus might do. So Jesus healed the man right in front of him. Just, I just love that Jesus had no fear of man. He was so hooked into what God wanted. And that's what he was interested in was fulfilling God's plan. And he'd let whoever be glad or whoever be mad. Just make sure that you're pleasing God because he's the one we want pleased. Amen. 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 So Jesus healed the man right in front of them. So there was an obvious immediate change in the man's condition. They could tell that he was healed. In verse 5, after the man is healed, in verse 5, Jesus answered them and said, Which of you shall have an ass or an ox fallen into a pit and will not straightway pull him out on the Sabbath day? So he's saying this, You would pull an animal out on a Sabbath day out of a pit. I'll pull a man out of a pit. I will pull a man out of the pit of sickness and disease on the Sabbath day. Anyone that's in a pit needs to be delivered. Yes. They need help. And he was, he was saying for you to have more compassion on an animal than you do on a man is misplaced compassion. We should be good to animals, but we should be better to humans. Amen. Jesus died for people. Amen. And then he was saying, you would, you would rescue an animal on the Sabbath day. So what they were against on the Sabbath day was you exerting yourself. You couldn't do any work on the Sabbath day. So he's letting them know for you to pull an animal out of a pit on the Sabbath day is more work than it is for me to pull a man out of the pit of sickness and disease. Why? Because with Jesus, everything's easy. Everything is easy. It is a work. It's a work, but not a hard work. It's an easy work. And so in verse six, and they could not answer him again to these things. They had no argument that could stand up in the face of these results. Amen. The sad thing about it is these religious leaders had no idea who was sitting in that house that day with them. Who was sitting at their table. They had no idea. They were blinded to this. They chose blindness. They chose blindness because right in front of them was worked miracle power, healing power. Right in front of them they could have chosen what you see. De- it depends on what you focus on. Yes. That's right. That's right. They they focused on their laws not being violated. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yes. That this man was a direct was acting in direct opposition to their guidelines. They did not choose to look, wait a minute, something greater than our guidelines has entered the room. <laughs> right. yeah. Power was there. Healing power was there. No telling who else would have been at that table that needed healing, but wouldn't receive it because they were spectating instead of participating. They didn't recognize God was in their midst. The Word made flesh was in their midst. He was sitting at the table with them and they didn't even recognize who was there. They didn't even recognize what He offered, what He brought. He asked them questions before He healed them, before He healed the man because He wanted them to hook on to the healing flow, not reject healing flow. 
The man that was healed didn't reject it, but he was wanting everyone to receive healing flow. Jesus was not delighted that the leaders weren't receiving their own help. He wanted them to be healed. Absolutely he did. So he's asking them questions to try to straighten out their thinking so that they'll hook in with him because God is in the room. God is manifesting. Healing power is manifesting. So I say this, when you go to church, God is in the room. Yes. Yes. When you go to your church services, God is in the room. Why? Because Jesus said, where two or more are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Where the word is being preached, God is in the room. Why? Because G the word, Jesus was the word made flesh. Jesus is, when the word is preached, Jesus is preached. Yes, ma'am. When the word is being delivered, he wants to manifest himself, but people need to recognize. So that means that when we go to church services, our mindset and our approach has to be appropriate. Uh -huh. That we recognize, I'm not just going to church because it's time for church. I'm going to church because I'm going to go have a visit with my father. I'm going to receive the anointing that's present in that room. Now, you know this, you can receive power at home because you are filled with God. He dwells on the inside of you. The greater one is in you. But what gets attention is what is going to flow. Yeah. Yeah. And Jesus was trying to get these leaders' attention off of their rules, yeah. off of their laws that were, yeah. that were hindering them from receiving from God. But they wouldn't take that opportunity. And all they did was become a spectator instead of receiving themselves what they would have needed that day. Because I don't care who you are, when God steps into your midst, you realize I need something. <laughs> we all need something. I mean, there's when when you're in his presence, you're well aware of needs that that he can provide for you. And so we have to recognize that when our pastor gets up in the pulpit, God is offering us something. God is offering us something through, not through a man, but through the office that man stands in. That pastoral office, if it's honored, if it's recognized, if it's magnified, then you can draw on the flow that comes through that office and it will change your life. But if we just go to church just out of a... a mindset a habit of a mindset yes. mm -hmm. to where we're just going to church and get in our chair and show up and mm -hmm. i'm a christian yeah. uh -huh. no we go expecting yes. something yes. we go ready to recognize what's being offered us in that service Amen. too many times if the pastor gets up to teach people think it's a lesser than flow right. Teaching is not a lesser than flow, than miracles, than healings. Because Jesus always took time to teach. Why? Because the word being taught is, the, is Jesus. Jesus is the word made flesh. And when we're taught about him, power is available. There is an anointing on the word. It is not a less than flow. It's a different flow, but not a less than flow. Jesus went everywhere teaching, preaching, and healing. Every flow was critical. Yeah. The yes. teaching was one flow, the preaching was a flow, and the healing was a flow. Yes. And every one of those flows were necessary. Yes. Every one of those flows were, were what the people needed. Yeah. 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 And if we will go to church and believe God, yes. these are the kinds of things that we can receive. We can receive of the teaching. We can receive of the preaching. But we should also be receiving of the healing. Yes. Amen. 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 So let us recognize when our pastor stands up yes. that we God is offering us something. Amen. God is offering us something. A flow through that pastoral office. 
that will feed our lives. Yes. Remember what it says in Matthew chapter nine, Jesus was ministering to the multitudes. They were sick. And it says that Jesus recognized that they were as sheep without a shepherd. They were fainting and they were scattered. So two characteristics that were pointed out in Matthew chapter nine of what happens to those who don't have a pastor. They faint, what's that mean? They, they, they fall out along the course of their race. Yes. They're not steady in their race. They're faltering. Sometimes they get off course. They're not even running the right race anymore. And then the other thing is he recognized that they were scattered. Well, what is sickness? The scattering of health. Yes. What is a divorce? The scattering of a marriage. Mm -hmm. What is wayward children? The scattering of a peaceful home. Yes. You see, God resident in that pastoral uh, office is the anointing to keep you from fainting Amen. and to keep Amen. your life from being scattered. Yes. Amen. God's offering us these things yes. every time we sit under that pastoral anointing, yes. but also you'll recognize the condition of that multitude that came to him that day. They were sick. Uh -huh. yes. Under the pastoral anointing, uh -huh. people received their healing. Yes. 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 Amen. Amen. And as pastors, Amen. I've pastored for 25 years, as pastors, mm -hmm. it is our privilege, yes. but also our responsibility yes. to make sure that people can receive healing through Amen. the office we stand in. Yes. Amen. 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 And people may say, well, Jesus never told me to minister healing. We are, Jesus said, the works that I do shall you do also. Yes. What are the works that he did? Teaching, Teaching. preaching, Teaching. and healing. Yeah. Therefore, we are assigned his works. And he said, the works that I do shall you do also and greater works. We don't qualify for greater works till we've already done the works he did. The teaching, the preaching and the healing. Those come first. Amen. And then greater works is, is that you see a multiplication of the flow that you're operating in. A multiplication of light in the teaching and the preaching, a multiplication of results in healing power. So we have to remember that when we go to church, when we're around the man of God, we don't just sit there and just treat it like we're just around a buddy at, the, at, a, at a sports event. This is nothing like any other event in our life. When we go to church, there is nothing, no other event of our week that comes close to what is being offered us in the setting of the local church where the word is being taught. Amen. And power is being made available. Yes. So we need to recognize these leaders this day did not recognize who was in the house. So they criticized, they watched, they became critical, they became observers instead of participators. Yes. So let us make sure that we recognize when we're with our pastor. When we have, we're in that setting. But what about this? Let us recognize who we are in Christ. Amen. Yes. Who yes. he has made us to be. Yes. Let us also recognize that the greater one is in us. Yes. Amen. Yes. Let us magnify and not reduce or diminish the greater one on the inside of us by how we talk, by how we live, by how we operate, by how we behave. Amen. Amen. So the number one reason these leaders did not receive anything for their own lives is because they did not recognize. This is an infirmity that many have. They don't recognize what God's offering them. They don't recognize who they've been made to be in Christ. The devil loves for us not to recognize these things. Now I want you to go with me and then we'll close with this. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, and we'll start reading in verse 17. This is a prayer that Paul prayed for the believers. He tells us what he prayed. This is a prayer that we need to be praying for believers, for our own congregation members, those that we go to church with, for fellow believers, for our family, 
And also we can pray them for ourselves or we, and let me say this, or we can take it for ourselves. Because when you know something belongs to you, you don't have to ask God to give it. You can just take it. But you do have to perform the act of taking it. So Ephesians chapter one and verse 17, and I'll start part way through that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of glory may give unto you the spirit of wisdom. Look at this. He gives it unto you. You don't earn it. He gives it that he may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Or we could say this, that God would allow you to see, give you the wisdom and the revelation of the knowledge of who you are in him. Verse 18, the eyes of your understanding or the eyes of your spirit being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe. So basically, just to sum up this verse, these two verses, Paul is saying, pray for others that they would, number one, know who they are in Christ. Number two, that they would know what they have because they're in Christ. And number three, that they would know what they can do because they are in Christ. Yes. Amen. Who they are, what they have, and what they can do. Amen. Because these leaders who sat with Jesus that day did not know really who they were yes. in covenant. Yes. In covenant. They were God's people who had a covenant with God and they forgot this. And then when God, Jesus, came into this room and manifested, they didn't cooperate because they forgot. They did not recognize who they were in their covenant and that what he, he offered to them as a flow belonged to them. And they resisted it instead of cooperating with it. So we're to pray for people. We're to pray for one another Amen. that people in the body of Christ, loved ones, family members, fellow congregation members, Father, help them to see. Yes. This is what Paul prayed. Help them to see. Give them the spirit of wisdom and revelation about who they are in Christ, what they have in Christ, and what they can do because they are in Christ. All we need. All we need in this life, we can draw out. Yes. Amen. We can draw out. Yes. Yes. But we have to remember who we are. Yes. We have to know who we are. Yes. And the word tells us in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3 that he has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Another translation said he's blessed us with everything that heaven itself enjoys. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's receive that. Yeah. Let's take it. Yeah. Let's believe it. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. We trust you've enjoyed today's program. Visit us at DufresneMinistries.org to learn of our upcoming meetings, share your testimony, submit a prayer request, or visit our online store. This program has been made possible by the friends and partners of Dufresne Ministries.